Good evening, friends. So as always on Mondays, I talk about peace and conflict studies and in some cases, communication studies and just a bunch of things that I find very fascinating. And sorry, I need to mute YouTube. That was, a, that was not a fun mistake to make, but I'm very happy to be here chatting with you all. I'm very happy to be able to have this opportunity to have conversations with people who are interested in these topics from a humanistic point of view. The purpose of today's video is to talk about reframing conflict, which is a very important process in peace work and in conflict work. And in order to help illustrate that, I made some notes that I'm probably going to be sharing when this is over. I'm probably going to put them in the comment section where people can go and look at them. I'll make them public so that people can see what it is that I'm talking about when I talk about some of these things. And I wanted to start this live stream off by discussing how it is that people conceptualize and react to the thought of conflict. I'm not going to say that everyone reacts in quite the same way, but I am going to say that a lot of people have a pretty negative reaction to conflict, which makes sense because we've been socialized since birth to think that conflict is negative, it's destructive. It's something that we should try to avoid if it's at all possible. And the reality is it's not always possible to avoid conflict. and also. Lots of conflict, not necessarily lots of conflict, but conflict can in many cases be a good thing and it can be something worth people trying to overcome constructively and positively. And having this conception that conflict is a super negative thing is dangerous because it makes it so that we should have a false sense of fear towards conflict. And lots of people now are starting to gain a stronger understanding of conflict and a more positive understanding of conflict. But for a long time, all the way up until I was a kid, whenever people would get into conflicts, it'd be shown as some sort of negative thing and be shown as something that shouldn't be encouraged. And that's really frustrating for someone who is interested in communication and in peace and conflict studies. Conflicts, when acknowledged and worked through positively and openly, can result in trust being built between people and bonds being deepened and a new relationships forming where relationships were previously non-existent or in some cases negative. And this is an important thing if we are going to live our best possible lives as social beings. We need to have positive conceptions of things that are often negative, like conflict. Because it's true that conflict can be disruptive and conflict can be dangerous, but that's when violence emerges or that's when conflict is handled negatively. And that doesn't have to be. There are lots of different ways that people can encourage more open communication and that people can encourage dialogue during conflicts because conflicts are often the best times and the best places to show communication and to show genuine interest in other people's opinions because it's easy to have shallow desires to be positive and to be kind to people when you are not in an active state of conflict with them. It's only when you are in conflict that you are showing just how much you trust someone, just how much you value their opinion, and just how much you actually want them to be a part of the communities that you're building. In order to reframe conflict in a more positive way, something that I like to do with people that I've worked with and communities that I've spoken with are ask them to do a simple activity for me. And what I like to ask them to do is I like to ask them to think of conflict in the abstract. And I want them to then write down what their initial thoughts are on conflict in the abstract. I hope that everyone's having a great night. I'm happy to see that some more people are coming on. I'm very grateful that people are in the comment section and chatting because this is something that I want to do. And I love that I have a community that enables me to do this. I have a community that's actually interested in this and that I know is willing to have conversations with me, especially because if you ask me, my content's kind of boring. And I know that that's not like what everyone thinks, but at the very least, the things I talk about are often boring, even if they're important. And I do kind of wish that I had a more charismatic like presentation of these sorts of things, but I'm happy to be presenting the things that I care about in the ways that I care about, because I think that there are things that are worth talking about and worth presenting on, even if you're, you're developing sort of presence and sort of community and you want to be charismatic, you want to be entertaining and all of that, but sometimes it's important to be educational. So I'm happy to have a community that's like that, and I'm happy that I have so many friends that are 
commenting in the comment section down below. In order to get back to what I was saying, what I like to ask people to do is I like to ask them to think about conflict in the abstract and write down what it is that they think of right after they think of conflict. What are the words and the feelings they associate with conflict? And then I ask them to write down an example of a real world conflict that's not necessarily personally affecting them, but possibly could. I want them to write down their initial thoughts and feelings about that conflict as well. And then I want them to write about a conflict that in the big scheme of things isn't actually super important, but affects them in some way, even if it's a really minor way. And then I ask them to write down how they think and feel about that specific conflict. After that, I look at what they wrote and we have a conversation about it. I've been surprised that people often don't have the negative conceptions that I initially thought they did, but I know that other people who've done this, especially who worked with older people or people from different cultures, have experiences where these words are usually pretty negative and oftentimes pretty aggressive. And that is an interesting thing for us to observe because then we can have a conversation about why it is that they think that way. And if they would like to think of these things in a different way, usually people, once I've had a conversation with them, want to think about things in a slightly different way, but they don't know how to go about changing their sort of mind state. And when I have conversations with them about what it is that they'd like to change, I am able to understand where it is that they're coming from, and I'm able to learn from their perspective. I really appreciate having that ability because then we can have a conversation about what sorts of things and what sort of material they would need to better be able to change their minds and to gain a more nuanced opinion on these sorts of things. And I think that that's something that's really important because if we are able to get rid of this idea that conflict is something that's super negative and conflict is something that should be avoided, we're able to have a healthier conception of conflict. And also we're able to gain an understanding of our own internal ability to, to relate to conflict, to react to conflict, and to, I really like, I really like Duke's answers on uh, section. Also, I love that you guys are actually doing this because I, I've been thinking of ways to not necessarily create like a class about this, but to sort of do my own research in my community and to work with people who want to gain the sorts of skills that I'm gaining, the sorts of knowledge that I'm gaining on individual ways. And I've been thinking of like creating more sections for my website, LucianaTheWriter.com. And yes, that was a plug for my website, but this is also a genuine thing. Like I'm, I'm being serious about this. I, I do want to learn how it is that I can help people on an individual level because lots of people want to gain the sorts of perspectives that I talk about and the sorts of perspectives that I have, not necessarily my own specific perspectives, but gain a healthier way of looking at conflicts and a more objective way of looking at conflicts. It's really funny. And so I've been thinking of like creating software on my website or like little things on my website where I can ask people like their opinions, I can gain insight into their background, and then I can work with them on an individual level. And of course, there are going to be things that I would like to charge for because I would like to make a living doing this sort of thing. I think that conflict work is an important thing, and I think the conflict workers deserve to be able to make a living, even and especially people who are doing freelance conflict work and people who are not part of a larger organization, but are just kind of doing their own thing like me. I think it'd be fun to try and do that. And that's something that I probably will try to do in the next couple of weeks and the next couple of months on my website for anyone who's interested. But getting back to what I was talking about earlier, I think it's important that people have an awareness of how it is that they react to conflicts and how it is that they can talk about these issues in a more healthy way. And conflicts are often opportunities for people to engage in conversations that they might not otherwise feel comfortable engaging in. And that's a really important aspect of conflict. And Mrs. Snarky just said one of the perfect things, positive side of conflict, creates urges to promote social change. And also, I am in fact reading the comments. I know it's different from last time where I was like super in the comment section and also like not super focused but I've created a little bit of a format that you guys can check it out in the description down below if you're curious. I'm going to start off with my little lecture, my little spiel, and then I'm going to get into like having a more interactive section and be talking to people. 
And also, there's an after party this time. If you guys want to join in, if you guys want to chat with me, let me know here. I will be sending out links to the after party from probably 8.45 to maybe 9, 9.15. And then we'll be getting started in the after party, which will last less than an hour. And I know that's like kind of minute stuff, but since this is my second live stream, people don't know about like the agenda that I have and like the formatting that I've thought about. So I felt like sharing that. But reframing conflict is a really important thing because it's important that people stop being scared of conflict. I genuinely understand why it is that people are fearful for conflict and people don't want to get into conflict. And I'm not saying that people should be like hyper aggressive or completely ready to get into conflicts. I'm saying that when a conflict is about to occur, we shouldn't necessarily run from it. We should see it as a positive opportunity for our communities to grow and for the relationships that we have and that we value to deepen. Because it's really easy for a relationship to be really shallow but seemingly perfect, where you guys never disagree, where the community is always in perfect harmony. But the reality is the times when the bonds, the depths of our bonds are tested are when we are in conflict, how we interact with each other, how we change in our interactions. And the level of seriousness with which we take the opinions of others, like people that we disagree with, who are members of our community. These are things, these are things that matter. And this relates to something called relational health, which is something that I'm going to be talking about in a future live stream. I've already made a video where I introduce people to the concept of relational health. It's actually my most recently uploaded video after this one. If you guys want to check it out, you can always, you know, subscribe to my channel and check out my other stuff. But relational health is essentially a measure with which our ability, it's a measure of our ability to socialize healthily and effectively. It's also a measure of our ability to adapt to new social situations well. And relational health directly relates to peace and conflict studies. And there are objective benefits to relational health, like people having, people being less likely to have the more severe side effects of mental health disorders. There are actually relational disorders and a whole series of social stigmas and social things that are attributed to relational health or a lack of relational health. So it's really important that people have an understanding of these sorts of concepts. And these sorts of concepts are understood by people in like public health, people in my field, peace and conflict studies, people in communication studies, and people in psychology. And most people, I would argue, have a sort of intuitive understanding of things like relational health and social well-being, but they don't have the exact vocabulary needed to articulate it, which is very fascinating to me. It's very interesting to me to have conversations with people since I understand these things and I can articulate them in, at the very least, a more academic way. I wouldn't say that I can articulate them well in a more regular sense with people who aren't in academia, but I know that in academic circles, I'm perfectly capable of articulating these things and I'm capable of at least describing these things in a way that makes them understandable to other people. These are important things that people should understand, which is part of the reason why I'm over here creating content that talks about them. So I'm going to move on to a slightly different topic, and that is relational, not relational health, <laughs> reframing conflict in a specifically conflict context. And what I mean here is the actual sort of reframing that people in my field mean when we talk about reframing conflict. Reframing conflict is a sort of expression or a sort of word that means the specific ways with which a conflict is viewed through the lens of a conflict worker or someone who has otherwise heard both sides of a conflict or all sides of a conflict and has created a unified understanding of it. <laughs> yes, yeah, so like, for some reason, my mind just sort of wandered off there. And what this actually refers to is a process by which people gain an understanding of a conflict because a frame of a conflict is one particular way that a group of people involved in a conflict understand the conflict. It's essentially the narrative that they've created. And if we can understand that narrative and the narratives of other people involved in the conflicts, then we can gain a healthier understanding of the conflict overall. And we can come up with a sort of unified understanding or a unified narrative 
that makes it possible for people to have a holistic understanding of, at the very least, the stories and the language and the imagery involved in the conflict. Maybe not necessarily the conflict itself, at the very least, not holistically, but this is something that's a valuable step for people who want to make it possible for groups involved in a conflict to have a singular understanding that isn't just a group of conflicting narratives or narratives that only tell one side of the story. Yes, what Mrs. Snarky said is a fairly solid way of looking at it, objective third-party reporting. And this is a valuable step for people who want to create a single unified narrative that peace workers can use going forward. And it's also a really solid way to make sure that people understand the conflict. Because if you are in a sort of conversation with all the parties involved in the conflict, then you can be like, this is my understanding of the conflict after listening to everyone involved in the conflict's stories, after hearing what they have to say, after hearing how they understand the conflict. Here's one solid story that we can use to move forward and to have an understanding of each other in a way that's healthier and more social. And by having that unified understanding, Standing, we are making it possible for people to move forward, which is a very important thing to do because if we only listen to one side of a conflict or the other side of a conflict, then we are not going to be able to give everyone justice. And we are not going to be able to create the most justice possible for all parties involved. And we have to understand that when we are looking at conflicts, oftentimes it's difficult to make everyone believe in the true win-win situation. But it is possible in some types of conflicts, especially in what those of us in conflict work call interest-based conflicts, which are conflicts that are after certain tangible, malleable objectives. These don't have to be like literal things, but they definitely can be. If two parties are fighting over a single piece of land, this is a really solid example. An interest-based conflict can be one group wanting to do something with land, like develop it, or another group wanting to do something like preserve it. And these are things that make sense. These are things that are tangible. You can see the change in society or the change in the land that the sort of victory where one group wins would cause. And oftentimes, this can be reframed. We can have an understanding of this where we can ask people, instead of being like, what thing do you want? You can ask them, what do you want from the thing? Because it's possible that if you want something like to create jobs or to boost businesses, using the thing, it's possible that you could actually have a mutual interest with the other party that, say, wants to preserve the thing. Because if you are trying to preserve a piece of land, you can definitely create jobs in land management. You can create jobs in government, you can create jobs in a wide range of different industries that revolve around protecting the land. And that is still protecting the land itself. I, for some reason, my camera appears to have shut off, even though my camera on my end is still going. Oh, there it is. That was very strange. Sorry for that disruption. I noticed it on my end because I am in the comment section and I am also like watching the conflict. I'm watching the conflict section, the comment section as well. And this is not always going to be the case. And it's definitely harder for some types of conflicts because many types of conflicts that people can think of are conflicts that are value-based. And value-based conflicts are a lot harder to create a singular shared understanding of, at the very least, one that both sides can agree to. Because if one side of an idea-based conflict is interested in dehumanizing some other party, then it's really difficult to create a single narrative that does that justice while also condemning that point of view because people should be able to think or believe or be whatever they want to be provided that thing that they want to be isn't pretty good. And obviously there are problems with this sort of framing and there are problems with trying to reframe this sort of thing. But even then, oftentimes, there are things that people want, there are objectives that people have, that people can work on together and collaboratively, even if both sides seem to be at a sort of impasse where one side doesn't want anything else but to dehumanize the other side. 
Oftentimes, that's not the case. It's just that the rhetoric that they are using is disruptive to peace efforts, and it's disruptive to efforts to make it possible to move forward productively as a society together. And it's important to acknowledge when this sort of thing is the case, because if you are going to speak truth to power, or if you are going to fight for actual justice, you have to know when to stand up and condemn one side or another. And you can do that while still being like, I want what's best for everyone in this conflict. But the reality is the leadership of one side or the other is doing and saying things that not only do not benefit the people they're directly hurting, but also harm the people involved in their own community, the people they're supposed to represent, the people they're supposed to be leading in positive and productive ways. And this is an important process. This is an important and valuable task for peace builders, for conflict workers. And it's frustrating for a lot of us because there's this idea that in order to be objective, you have to be neutral. And this is a similar idea that's in history and that's also in journalism. And it's really frustrating to try and overcome this. In fact, I have a feeling that if people in my field saw me talking about this in this particular rough way, there would be people who wouldn't really like it. And that's understandable because this is a rough thing to hear if we've been socialized and we've been taught to believe that in order for someone to be objective, they have to be neutral. That is not the case, but this is a difficult idea to overcome. Unfortunately, in order to overcome it, some of us are going to have to be willing to take the risks that come with speaking out against it. And there are people aside from me who are willing to do that. There are people in my field who point out that things like justice are not neutral. Things like truth are not neutral. And this is an important thing, but I'm very happy to see more and more people realizing and speaking up about. So I was wanted to talk a little bit before I went into the more interactive section of this about the idea and about ways that people can practice reframing conflicts. Now, this is a difficult thing to do. I mentioned one particular way to go about it on an individual level earlier where I talked about like writing out your ideas about and your feelings about things like conflict in the abstract, real world conflicts that don't necessarily affect you and personal conflicts. But in order for people to gain the sort of experience needed for them to truly and consistently reframe conflicts, yes, I know the camera just went out. I don't know why that keeps happening. I'm sorry, I'm gonna keep powering through. It seems like you should still be able to hear me. So if you can't, please let me know. I'm gonna type a comment in the comment section. Uh, for some reason, it seems to be linked to, um, it seems to be linked to how often I have the Google Hangout thing open for some reason. So that's weird. I didn't know that was a thing that happened. That's never happened to me before. So that's a new thing for me to know. But in order for people to actually gain experience reframing conflict in a positive way, we have to gain practice with it. And for a lot of us, there are no safe situations for us to be able to do that. There are no safe places where we can do that. But some of us do have that ability. We can think of this in our day-to-day -day interactions with people, especially if we have friends and family members who are very combative, who are always ready to disagree with us. And that's a really frustrating thing for a lot of us, but we can definitely use it to practice how we consider, how we contemplate, and even how we talk to other people in conflict situations, which is very nice, very useful. I I'm having a lot of fun with this live stream, but I've been talking for so long that I'm trying to focus and it is not super easy. This has been a solid 22 minutes of just straight talking, which is fun. I really like it, but it is, I don't usually focus this long on one thing super consistently. So you guys are gonna have to give me a second to let my brain catch up. But I hope that you guys are having a really fun time so far. I'm having a lot of fun with this. I know that it's probably a little bit of a boring way to talk about this, but I am working on ways to make this more professional and to make this more lively in the future. Odds are there are going to be topics where I talk about this with other people, both people in my field and people in other fields as well. But in order for people to best gain experience working with this idea, 
in order for people to best gain comfort working with a reframed conception of conflict, it's best that we have opportunities to practice that in the real world. And for a lot of us, that is harder than it might be for some other people. In my notes, I briefly talk about teachers and supervisors having opportunities to do this more regularly because they oversee people so they can play a part in a peace process without being directly involved in the conflict itself. And that's something that is not super fair. And I, I like part of the reason I say that is that I talk about these things like the people involved in these conflicts are super safe, which they really aren't. That's kind of unfair of me to say because students don't necessarily feel super safe if they are involved in a conflict situation at school. Workers definitely don't feel super safe being involved in a conflict situation at work. But also there are other more fun ways that we can gain experience doing this. And some of the ways are we can actually have training sessions, whether it's at school with other teachers, at school with students, or at work with your supervisors and your coworkers, wherein you guys have a sort of mock conflict. You play out the conflict, and then you guys play different parts in the peace process. Some of you guys are the supervisors, some of you guys are the workers. And obviously, like there are ways to do that that people have already written out. I'm working on writing out my own little exercises to help people with this, because eventually I do want to start not necessarily selling peace and conflict processes, but actually monetizing my skills directly and working with people in communities who are interested by selling them sort of training exercises and different definitional sheets and just things like that, training resources, because these are things that I created before. I'm sorry to make that really but there are definitely ways that people can practice and there are ways that people can do it somewhat safely and there are ways that we can do it without putting ourselves at risk without being super artificial about this because if someone's like hey we're going to do a training exercise today about peace and conflict and we're going to have people be conflict resolvers and people be mediators all of that does feel kind of artificial that's fair but there are real advantages to doing it in this particular way because then people can just sort of have fun with it. People can have a little bit of a break from the regular work that they often do. People can just sort of relax and they can have fun watching people put themselves out there, practicing improv and practicing communication. And a lot of that is super fun. A lot of that's definitely really different from what often goes on in an office or in a school, but it's still really valuable. And also, if you put yourself in a conflict mind state, even temporarily, you can sort of understand where it is that you yourself are coming from when you're in a conflict situation unexpectedly. Because if you are not used to being in a conflict situation, if someone just comes at you, it's going to be really scary. And I know that that's really frightening for a lot of people, which is part of the reason I recommend that companies and businesses and people, like groups of people, do not shy away from conflicts. People should know how it is that they're going to react if they're suddenly in a conflict situation. That is some scary stuff. And in order for you to best be able to be safe and be yourself in a conflict situation, you need to be willing to put yourself out there and be like, hey, this is a real thing that's gonna happen. I wanna know how it is I'm gonna react if someone just starts coming at me aggressively and I wasn't expecting it. And the only way I'm going to familiarize myself with that is if when it happens in the real world, I don't shy away from it. And also if there are opportunities to practice, I take them. I know that's scary as someone who has social anxiety, believe me, I get it. But it's also a really important part of understanding yourself as a social being, as a person in the real world where people have arguments and people get in conflicts. And now that I have been talking for a solid 30 minutes, Boy. I am going to have a little bit more fun with the rest of this. I am going to start looking at the comment section more. I had, I had focused on the camera thing so that way it wouldn't go off again, and it doesn't seem to have. So it does appear for some reason that is the thing that was going on. We all learn stuff. I'm sorry that these first couple of live streams are a little bit less formal and more me kind of goofing off with y'all, but. One, this is a fun way and a lot of ways to learn about this sort of stuff. And also, it's fun for me. And I get nervous about this sort of stuff. So I'm very happy to be here. So, yeah. So, yeah. And also, 
Thanks, Wonder Lady. I'm very excited to see someone else plugging my Patreon because I would definitely benefit from having more Patreons. I feel like the quality of the channel would have a noticeable increase and that'd be really nice because I love creating content, but one, creating content is really not cheap. Like people, people don't realize, even if you're on a phone, which I did for a while, like even if you're on a phone, creating content is not cheap. Also, I really hope that on the actual live stream, other people can see it in better quality than I can because my quality on this is super bad. I don't know if that's the case for everyone else, but it's definitely the case for me. I have a feeling that like, it's probably fine on other people's because I can see myself in the camera and the quality is fine. It's definitely not like super high definition, but it's, it's nice, you know? So I've been thinking about creating an Amazon wish list. And also now is when I'm really going to be paying attention to if anyone wants to come on to the after party. I've been, I've been sending out my, like I've been sending out, not the link, but stuff related to it to individual people. I'm going to be messaging people who are in here. They want to come on to the after party. That would be super nice. And um, that'd be a lot of fun. That's going to be at 9. This is probably going to go on to about 8.45. Yeah, 8.45, 8.50, more or less. And then I'll be doing the other one, and I'll be sending out the actual link to people. I, I am going to be creating an Amazon... Hey, I got a new subscriber. Um, it is going to be create... Jesus Christ, you guys. English. English. I feel like I should pat myself on the back because I went talking 30 minutes almost nonstop and I didn't notice any mess ups in my English. So that's nice. I got a new subscriber just now, which is very nice. I am going to be creating an Amazon wish list. So if people who have experience creating an Amazon wish list want to suggest things for me, especially lighting, because my lighting is comically bad. I'm more than capable of laughing at my own technical shortcomings. So if you guys find it hilarious just how bad my lighting is, even now, kind of especially now, like, laugh, it's fine. Um, I'm going to be creating an Amazon wish list where I talk about, like, I'm going to be doing recommendations for books for both myself to read and for other people to read. I am going to mark in them whenever I am like whenever I have them personally, just recommend them for other people. And I'm also going to have stuff like lighting and mics and just audio stuff. Although my audio is usually pretty okay. My audio has never been, like aside from my very first videos, my audio has never been horrendous, but it's also never been good. That's a, the fun thing about being you know, an amateur YouTuber. So yeah, super fun. Also, just a, just a really minor thing. One of my big goals is to hit 250 subscribers. I, I, I can actually make that by the end of this year if I gain a new subscriber every day. And I'll still have a couple of days left. So if you want to recommend, if you, if you guys want to plug my channel, I'm going to be plugging the heck out of my channel over the course of the next couple of weeks. But if you guys want to do that, I'd really appreciate it. Because when I was younger, I had a YouTube channel when I lived in Honduras. And I made videos about once or twice a month. It wasn't really, it wasn't really big, but I hit 25 subscribers, which was 25 more than I ever thought I'd have. So for me, one of my big personal goals, like the, the first real milestone of my YouTube career would be, love yourself, would be to hit 250. And if I can do that, whenever I do that, I'm going to do a Q&A. And I am going to have fun with my camera. I'm going to have fun with Adobe Premiere Pro because I've never really edited in the particular style that I want to edit in. But I want to do the thing where like people take screenshots and comments and questions and just like put them in the video, which is a thing I don't know how to do because I am technologically illiterate. I'm really bad. I'm actually like comically bad at technology. It's kind of a miracle I was able to figure out how to do Google. That's, that's how not good a technology I am. Also, I'm going to be doing, I'm recording a podcast tomorrow, and I am super, super excited for that. I'm doing it with someone who I want to create more videos and stuff 
and I want her to gain more of an online presence. And we're very excited to be working together for a whole bunch of different reasons. I don't know if we're ever going to upload the video that we file, the video that we film tomorrow, but we are going to be uploading future ones to my channel and to her channel. It's going to be super exciting. Right now, Thought Train podcast, and I honestly kind of love the name the Thought Train for just a whole bunch of different reasons. But mostly because like we're going to be we're going to be talking about a whole bunch of different stuff. Uh, Anna, super excited for that. Also, one lady and I are probably going to try to do podcasts together. We're gonna to be talking about that in the after party because Wonder Lady has confirmed she's gonna be in the after party. That's uh, super exciting. I am so down for the after party, y'all, because honestly, like it feels really weird talking to yourself in front of a camera when there are people who are like watching live, but you're still not talking to anyone. Technically, you can't like hear anyone else aside from you if you don't know how to like separate audio and recording audio like I was able to figure out how to do. That's probably the only technological thing I've ever done that I'm really proud of. I was able to figure out how to make it so that you guys don't hear echo on my end. And if you guys ever hear echo, it is not because of me, which is super exciting because I am a technological dum-dum. Very dumb when it comes to technology. I don't even do, like, the only sort of technological thing I do on my own videos, is, aside from recording them, is the thumbnails. And I've done some of them in Photoshop, but I've done a whole bunch of them in Havana. And Havana is really neat. I'm super excited for Cabana to be becoming more official. I'm actually probably gonna like pay to be like a premium Cabana member since I use Cabana for like all of my graphic editing, even though I have Photoshop. Photoshop is way too advanced for me. It is. Oh, that is that is um a hard thing to figure out. When I did my internship at American Atheist, the only thing that I consistently had a really, really hard time doing was like Photoshop. And also, Wonder Lady made me new banners for my content. I tried, so I'm uploading some of them little by little, including on my personal like Facebook page where I write about writing and about conflict work. I'm probably gonna start sharing that and my Discord link again. We're, we're getting ready to end this because this is mostly stream of consciousness and you talking about social media, but if you guys have questions about conflicts and stuff, I would absolutely love to answer them, whether it's here or in the after party, which I'm about to link to. I already have the scheduled post for that set up. I just, okay, the chat. For some reason, I accidentally hit my chat on my screen, which is not fun. But I'm, <laughs> I really love these weekly live streams. I actually wrote out like a much longer version of my notes that then I just like did, like I ended up changing some of them. So originally it was going to be actually 30 to 45 minutes, just me lecturing. But then when I edited my notes, I was able to make it shorter. If people want a thought exercise on, the, on this sort of thing, something that I would recommend doing is trying to unpack, especially if you're actually afraid of conflicts, because being afraid of conflicts is a perfectly reasonable position. It really is. Conflicts can genuinely be disruptive and conflicts can be dangerous. I don't want people to think that I'm over here underplaying and underpinning the importance and the dangers of conflicts. But conflicts don't have to be dangerous in many contexts and conflicts don't have to be disruptive or destructive. Sure, it can make things a little bit harder to do thoroughly. But the reality is oftentimes when a conflict emerges, especially if it's between people who generally agree, there's a reason for that conflict that isn't necessarily negative. And knowing how to solve conflicts are important. Wonder Lady and I are gonna talk about some of Wonder Lady's responses right now in the comment section in the party, assuming that Wonder Lady is okay with that. I don't wanna like make assumptions about that. But if she is, we're gonna have a conversation about that because this is the sort of thing that I really wanna do. 
I want to gain practice consulting people and consulting organizations on communications, on how to create cultures of openness and cultures of peace. And that's actually going to be the topic of next week's live stream. Next week's live stream is going to be ways to create cultures of peace and cultures of honesty, openness, and basically how to make it possible for conflicts to be constructive and positive by creating atmospheres of openness and genuineness. And that really matters. I am going to publicize the notes that I am made for this. These notes don't have any particular resources. It's mostly a transcript of what I said when I was in sort of stream of consciousness in something in the comments or something about social media. I'm going to put it in the comment section before tomorrow morning. So if you guys want to see the notes that I took, you will be able to. You'll also be able to share them. I'm going to start taking notes probably in a more academic way with citations and stuff over the course of the next couple of weeks as I start getting ready for this earlier and earlier and as I start putting time in because I'm discussing more specific concepts. Right now what I'm doing with these next couple of lectures slash live streams is helping people gain a sort of foothold, um, a foundation in the sorts of things that I want to talk about and in sort of language and interactivity that I want to talk about them in, especially because I feel like these conversations in a lot of ways are kind of more engaging than the regular videos I make, which is fair because I, I like creating videos that are entertaining and stuff, but honestly, I'm kind of scared of it. I'm scared of like, being like, this is me when I'm having fun. And like, this is my way of approaching like a conflict or a topic in a really charismatic and entertaining way. And a lot of fun. Thank you, Mrs. I hope that you can come on to the after party. I haven't messaged you yet, but I'm about to. So if you can, I would love to have a conversation with you too. I am going to end this one right now. I definitely appreciate you guys coming and having this conversation with me. The after party is going to be at nine. I already have a scheduled tweet, thanks to Tweet Deck, that will like schedule, that will show everything at nine. So if you already follow me on Twitter or if you're already subscribed to me, then you'll definitely get that notification. Also, if you're subscribed to me, I am going to do that typical YouTuber thing. So I hope you guys will forgive me. If you're if you're subscribed to me and you like the sort of stuff that I talk about definitely hit the notification bell. I know that I have a hard time getting like the right notifications at the right times but when people upload stuff regularly, like especially if they have scheduled stuff, which is part of the reason why I appreciate people like Dear Mr. Atheist or Mr. Atheist, I guess. And it's because like they do premieres and stuff. And I'm definitely not gonna do premieres at the very least not to like get like a thousand subscribers at the very least. I'm not going to do premieres. Also, I don't think my content's interesting enough to merit that. But if you like the conversations that I have, if you like being part of the community that I'm making, I definitely do recommend hitting the notification bell. It helps me out by making it possible for you to always get notified when I upload a new video, especially now that I'm doing more than one video a week, which is a definite change from the past. But yeah, I'm going to end this right now. I cannot wait to talk to you guys in a few minutes in the after party. I sincerely hope that you come and visit. And also, if you have comments, if you have criticisms, constructive or otherwise, that you want me to know and you want me to consider going forward in this live stream series, I really hope that you let me know in the comment section or in a message on Twitter, in a message on YouTube, although I still don't know how to get out YouTube's like inbox system. But I'll definitely check it out. If you guys can't make it to the after party, I hope that you have a wonderful night and that we get to comment and have conversations later on. Until then, I'll see you guys around.